Lord, we are grateful. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for all that you still plan to do. Thank you for another beautiful Sunday. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of health. Thank you for the things that could have destroyed us that you didn't permit to. Thank you, because we may not be where we want to be, but we are not where we used to be. Someone said we may have lost something, but you are the reason we haven't lost everything. We are grateful. Thank you for that person in this service who's burdened, wondering where the answers to their prayers will come from. Thank you because in this service you have answers for them. Thank you for that person for whom today's sermon is prepared. Lord, we believe with that person that their hearts will connect with your word and healing will happen to those people in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that person in this service trusting you for healing, emotional healing, physical healing, someone that needs you to take their pain away. We thank you because by the end of this service they will look for that pain and they won't find it. Thank you for that person that has been hurt. Someone said something very painful and that person is hurting right now. We receive your healing in their hearts. Your word says it is near that justifies me. We pray for that person that has been wrongly accused. Let your word speak for them in the name of Jesus. In this sermon, Lord, we receive your understanding. We receive your wisdom. Your word says I rejoice at your word as one that finds great spoil. Let the treasures in your word be made available to someone in this service. In the name of Jesus. We give you praise, Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, good morning to you. Especially if you're watching from our part of the world. If you're watching from Europe or from Africa, then that would be a good afternoon to you. Or maybe good evening as the case may be. Thank you so much for logging on to service today. I'm so sure you've been blessed already uh, listening to uh, the praise worship, listening to uh, the special song. Uh, it's, it's always a joy here at PCG to minister to people in different forms. All right. And again, I'm, I'm sure you were blessed by our uh, last Sunday's service, okay, the discussion we had, and that cute ending with our kids, right, was, was just beautiful. I can't get tired of watching all of it. Okay, all of this is right there on our YouTube channel. Take your time to watch it. Uh, the Father's Day special is important because fatherhood is a big deal. I need not go into all of those details again, but you can always pick nuggets that will help you from that service. So you can always get back on our YouTube channel and watch all of it and have a good time uh, by yourself or maybe with your father. All right, good. So today we want to continue on the discussion that we have been having, men like us. Okay, if you're joining us for the first time or for some reason you were not a part of the previous discussions, uh, the whole idea of Men Like Us series is to uh, look into the stories of certain Bible characters, right? We want to profile each of them uh, with the intent to uh, make it clear the fact that they are like us. You know, uh, in the book of James, chapter 5, verse 17, James started by saying Elijah was a man like us. And that was very important because uh, up until that time, Elijah had been seen as a demigod, one of the greatest prophets ever, called fire from heaven, and was one of the two people that were reputed not to have died, but have just simply left the earth, right, without dying, okay? And so it was quite impressive that James would say to his readers that despite all of these glorious things this man did, it was just like us. And we felt the burden to make it clear to everyone here is that the Bible characters are very much like us. Number one, these things happened. These people are real. Number two, the God they served that won battles for them and did stuff through them is the same one we serve now. That's the whole idea. And maybe number three, uh, for us to understand that just as Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is consistent. Times may be changing, but God is consistent. And whatever he did for those people, he's able to do with us here. 
Okay, so we will look at different Bible characters and we'll pick lessons from their lives um, as we trust God to do his wonders in ours as well. And so today, I will be teaching on a different Bible character. The last time we had this conversation, we talked about Joseph. Today, it's a lady, but I'm not changing it to women like us. It's still men like us. Today, we'll be discussing Bathsheba. Okay, Bathsheba. Again, another part um, of all of this conversation is that the Bible characters we are talking about may not necessarily be the most popular in the scriptures, okay? And that, that helps us a lot more because then it helps you to relate uh, to people that may not have so much fan base, if you will. So today, it's Bathsheba, okay? And if you would like to have maybe a secondary topic for it, then you can write <clears throat> God's mercy at play. But it's Bathsheba we're talking about. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 to 5, is where I'll read from as I start this conversation today. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. And it reads, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to look at. And so David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Yes, very interesting story. Okay, um, a story of someone that uh, um, did not manage to get away with what he did, right? Um, so, it started with the King David walking on the roof of his palace, looking into another compound and seeing what he shouldn't have seen in the first place. And then things went down from there. Okay? The story of Bathsheba is a bittersweet one. It starts with this king, as I said, um, <laughs> that, that, that saw what he shouldn't have seen. And of course, he couldn't keep his mind out of it until he got to the point of no return. All right? Um, interestingly though, Bathsheba wasn't held responsible for any part of the whole saga. And this must be because of the peculiarity of their culture at that time. Okay? Um, typically, back then, um, in a very patriarchal society, women were inferior to men. And of course, everyone was inferior to the king. So if the king sent for you, you just had to show up. If the king said she, he wanted to sleep with you, maybe you had to, I don't know. <laughs> All right? uh, but. Indeed, Bathsheba's story has David written all over it. There's no way you're going to mention Bathsheba and David would not come up. And then maybe even Solomon comes up after that. All right. Um, David was the reason she became known. Um, and David's wife was all Bathsheba could be. Or maybe eventually Solomon's mother. Right. But Bathsheba wasn't going to stand on her own uh, because of the way their society was wired at that time. So it's quite understandable then that Bathsheba was not or is not the central figure in her own story. Interesting. You would, you would, you would hear Bathsheba anywhere and it's David's wife that everyone talks about. Okay? But again, she wasn't David's only wife. As a matter of fact, the Bible records seven wives that David had. Okay? And the Bible could not even number how many concubines he had. Among those wives was uh, Saul's daughter, Michal, who Saul gave to David as a reward for killing Goliath. Okay? Uh, there was Abigail, who David married um, after her husband Nabal died. Um, that's in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Okay? Uh, these were the only women in his life who had some little stories told about them. Okay? And uh, the Bathsheba we are learning about today had a little bit of story as well, just very tiny, maybe even less than the other two. All right? But the difference, though, is that our results were very obvious. And these results would always point to our influence. And so today we want to share on Bathsheba and talk about some of the things we've learned from Bathsheba's story. Okay? Um, uh, 
often negligible story, but that has a lot of content in there. Okay, so welcome to Bathsheba. All right, the first part of uh, the lessons I want to mention, and I think I, I will talk about four or five of those lessons, but the first one I want to mention, you can put it in your note and put it in the chat. And here it is. You may have been associated with evil, but you can always turn the story around. Okay, and, and that's probably all somebody here needs to hear. You may have been associated with evil, but you can always turn the story around. We were introduced to Bathsheba um, when she slept with the king, or when the king slept with her, depending on how you want to see it. Okay, um, so she slept with the king, got pregnant, and then her husband got murdered as a result. It was, it was just a crazy uh, kind of introduction that we had. And if you imagine being maybe Uriah's sibling, you know how you would think about Bathsheba? Of course. But then she moved in with the king after her husband's death, okay, and continued to live as per usual. So I can imagine how she was regarded in the palace. I can imagine how other wives looked at her. I can imagine how palace staff looked at her. Okay, um, uh, uh, and, and, and then she was living in the palace and probably in love with her husband's killer. The same person that ordered for her husband to be killed was now the person she was sharing a bed with. She was, was the person that was going to be the father of her child. I can imagine how much emotional turmoil she had at that time. I'm sure there, were, there are people here watching me who know what it means to have your mind messed up like Bathsheba's mind probably was. I lost my husband, and you are the reason. You killed my husband so I should hate you, but I love you. You killed my husband so I should be planning to kill you, but here I am sleeping with you every night, waking up next to you in the morning, smiling at you. I'm sure there are people here who haven't had it that extreme, but who know what it means to have your mind messed up, for you to be loving something you know you should hate, for you to keep doing something you know would keep you from getting to where you want to get. I'm sure there are people here who know what, what, what it means. Okay, uh, Paul mentioned it when he said, the things I would love to do, I find myself not doing. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who would deliver me from this burden of death? It can, it can be funny how you love someone you know you shouldn't love, and no matter who gives you the advice to desist, you can't. How you get addicted to something you know is killing you, but hey, it's still the first place you run to when you're feeling like you're dying. And so Bathsheba was there in that world, okay, living with her husband's killer. We don't know if she loved him, but it didn't matter, okay? He was a king, and in that society, that was all that mattered. So, here is the story of Bathsheba, okay? The story of conflict in there. You want to pray, but you need to catch up on social media. You know if you're not praying, or if you're on social media, you can't be praying. But you know that what your soul needs more is the prayer. But your hands have refused to drop your phone like there's a glue on it. You know what it's like, right? When you would rather bless somebody, but what comes out of your mouth is not a blessing. Usually, we have these conflicts from time to time. And Bathsheba seems to have it in a bigger, much bigger dimension. Okay? And so, there she was. Some would be looking at her and saying, wow, from a soldier's wife to the king's wife, what promotion. But I'm sure she wouldn't find it easy going out because people would look at her and say, you, 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 you are certainly not the wife material. How could you bring this upon your husband? And that was Bathsheba's life. The Bathsheba we were introduced to. But obviously she chose to make her present reality work because there she was stuck in the palace whether or not she loved the king. She was carrying this child and she had to make it work. So obviously she was focused on moving forward and you, you may ask, oh, so how do you know she made it work? We are getting to those points. But the first thing for her, I'm now in the palace. My original husband is dead. I got pregnant out of wedlock. 
In fact, I am quite culpable in the death of my husband. And you are watching me saying, well, I'm in this whole mess because of me. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to, to say, I believe God will get me out because I got into, into this trouble due to no fault of mine. It's usually more difficult when you open your eyes and walk into to trust God to take you out. Bathsheba was in this, walked into it. Oh, well, maybe not 100% at a wheel, but she walked into it. And now we have Bathsheba in the palace. People standing outside saying, wow, palace big bay. But she was probably facing battles every now and then in that palace. We don't have the details of what she faced, but we do know she succeeded. And that's the first point I'm making here, that you have been associated with evil. Doesn't mean you can't turn it around. You can always turn it around. Somebody needs to hear that. You can always turn it around. And that's very, very critical. Second thing we learn from Bathsheba here, preparation will always be rewarded. And you can drop that in the chat. But more importantly in your note, preparation will always be rewarded. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon, I believe, wrote there, I have returned under the sun and I have seen that the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to men of skill, nor favor to men of understanding. He said time and chance happens to them all. And it's been explained that time and chance talks about preparation and opportunities. That when preparation meets opportunities, then success happens. In Bathsheba's story, it appears that she was prepared. Why? Many people would think that Solomon was Bathsheba's only child, but he wasn't. As a matter of fact, Solomon was the last of her four sons. If you read in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5, Solomon had three older ones. In 1 Kings chapter 1, David's oldest surviving son, Adonijah, had proclaimed himself king when David was obviously old. Very interesting story. First Kings chapter 1. They had noticed that King David was looking tired, was sick, couldn't get out of bed. And they decided to give the king the one thing that would strengthen him. Guess what? A woman. <laughs> A new lady, Abishag. They said, go give this lady to the king. King James Version says to keep him warm. We know what that means. But then... Abishag then goes to the king and they notice that King David, a whole King David, did not touch her. A whole King David. When he didn't touch her, Adonijah realized his father was gone. And he said, hey, I'm the king. Since he was the oldest surviving son. I mean, the fact that David couldn't touch a woman for them just meant, oh, the king is gone. Wow, what a record. And so Adonijah went out and said, he was king, right? And it was at that time that Bathsheba went to the king to remind him of his promise to make Solomon king. In 1 Kings chapter 1, she went to the king and said, but, but you and I had this conversation before, and you promised me that Solomon, who was not or who is not our first child, and who is certainly not the oldest in the palace, probably not among the top five or top six or top seven oldest, we had a conversation where you promised me or we had an agreement that Solomon would succeed you as king. And now you wonder, but why wasn't she pushing for any of our older children? Because she had three older ones. Why wasn't she pushing for them? And when you think about this, because I thought about this, and then the Holy Spirit, I believe, led me to Proverbs chapter 31. And we all know that proverb, probably the most popular proverb, or chapter of Proverbs in the Bible. Proverbs 31, which we call the virtuous woman. At the beginning of that chapter, the writer Lemuel, which Bible scholars say is the same as Solomon, was saying in there about the things his mother taught him 
with regards to preparing for royalty and saying kings shouldn't get drunk. Kings shouldn't lose judgment, their sense of judgment. And he said these were the things his mother taught him from a young age, preparing him for kingship. And this made it quite easy to throw Solomon's name into the frame because by order he didn't deserve it. But obviously, with regards to preparation, he was there. And as we saw in the story of Joseph, where there is preparation, order can be sidestepped. In the story of Joseph, he had no business being with the king. He had no business becoming prime minister or anything like that. But when there was a problem, he was the person most ready to solve it that showed up. And hey, really, no result, no respect. It's easy to stand up and say, hey, this is what I feel I deserve. But the big question is, are you ready for this? Bathsheba prepared Solomon. Obviously took her time to prepare him. And at the right time, got the result. Preparation is key. Listen, as Christians, we preach about faith and we preach about trusting God for things to come. But how are you preparing for what God is preparing for you? How are you learning? What are you reading? Which new ideas are coming to you? What new relationships are you forming? God is preparing something for you. But you must prepare for it. Preparation will always be rewarded. Number three. The third lesson. Learn to work with people. Was another thing Bathsheba seemed to have. Because as toxic as the palace must have been at that time, um, when, when you read 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 12, and then verse 21, you see Bathsheba there telling David, hey, if Solomon does not become king, then we are not safe. Both Solomon and I are not safe. He said they will bring our guilt back on us. It must have been a toxic society, toxic home. And of course, you imagine that the other wives and their children would not by any means have forgotten how Bathsheba came into the home. And how suddenly her son was going to be preferred. And so you'd imagine that in that kind of home, each person would keep to themselves. But it appears that Bathsheba was quite approachable. And so you see it there that the prophet Nathan, in 1 Kings chapter 1, went to Bathsheba. The same Bathsheba that prophet Nathan had talked about when David killed Uriah. The prophet Nathan had called David and given him a parable about a man that kept his own many sheep and killed the neighbor's sheep to entertain his guests. Bathsheba was the sheep he was talking about. He said, you took somebody else's wife and then you killed the person. Bathsheba is a wife. So you would imagine that Prophet Nathan would have nothing to do with Bathsheba. But she was the one that he went to meet when Adonijah called himself king. And Nathan went to Bathsheba and said, listen, you have to go to the king and tell him to make your son king. Remind him of the promise he made. And you wonder, why was she the one he went to meet when there were other wives in that place? And while you are wondering, down the same um, book, 2 Kings, chapter 2 this time, Adonijah went to the same Bathsheba after Solomon had been made king. Adonijah wanted Abishag, the same lady I talked about, that David couldn't touch. Adonijah wanted her and went to Bathsheba and said to her, please, tell the king. I, I know I'm not king. I, 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 that's been taken from me. It's okay. But please tell the king to give her to me. Again, you wonder, why would he be able to walk up to 
a rival and the new king mother or queen mother they call them yeah <laughs> why would he be able to do that it appears Bathsheba was quite approachable she was someone they could talk to and it's a question I'd like to ask you watching me who can talk to you really okay who can advise you who can seek advice from you Yes, you're very spiritual. Yeah. You shut your eyes for 20 hours praying. Yes. But when you open them, it's human beings you see. What do you do with them? You know, they say that at uh, the lower management level in an organization, you need to have 75% technical skills and then 25% people skill. And then when you get to mid-management, you need 50% technical skill, 50% people skill. But at top management, you need 75% people skill and 25% technical skill. Because at that level, the bulk of your work is meetings, talking to people, helping them see your vision, taking advice from them, getting feedback from them, advising them and helping them to put up top performance. That's what you need to do at that level. And so that's the question. Oh, I'm an introvert. That's fine. I don't talk much. That's fine. But the fact that I don't talk much doesn't mean I should look arrogant. The fact that I don't talk much doesn't mean that when people talk to me, I frown at them. No. You must learn to work with people. I think it's John C. Maxwell that wrote one of his best-selling books, Winning with People. People will always be needed. Somebody said you have four relationships away from whoever you want to meet on us. And it's very critical you learn to work with people. Bathsheba story teaches us that. The first one. This one excites me. A bit technical, but exciting for me. Please write it down. Do not let your project outgrow you. Do not let your project outgrow you. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 17, when Adonijah went to Bathsheba to say, I, I, I want my father's latest wife. I, I want Abishag. He said to her, please speak to the king for me, for he will not refuse you. And that statement shows that he was aware of how much regard Solomon had for her. That same person who had prepared him for royalty in Proverbs 31. Adonijah was sure that, yes, Solomon has become king, but he was still going to listen to her even after he had achieved the kingship that she prepared him for. Of course, it didn't turn out that way, and it appears that Solomon subsequently outgrew her, of course, uh, from then on, judging by how many women he then ended up with and how he ended his life. Okay? But the point here is that Bathsheba, at that point, was believed to still have a very strong influence on her son. And the point at which it looks like that influence snapped was the beginning of Solomon's doom. This little point here tears marriages apart, tears relationships apart, tears organizations apart, because there comes a time when who I was is no longer sufficient. What I did is no longer sufficient. The question then becomes, what am I doing now? How am I growing now? How am I able to relate with the present realities? And I've seen many situations in which the wife is outgrowing the husband, the husband is outgrowing the wife, and now they can't have a conversation anymore because all this other person can talk about are the same things they talked about for the past 10 years. But this new person is seeing new things. And is more than happy to go outside and find somebody else that can discuss at their level. Not because they want to cheat, but because they want to converse. And man was made for association, not for isolation. In organizations, it happens. Oh, I was a part of those that founded this place. But then the organization got bigger. My skill didn't improve. My knowledge didn't improve. And so I was able to handle my bit when the organization had a hundred people as staff. 90,000 people requires a different set of skills. 
but I don't have it. And so they want to let me go, but I'm angry, really mad, because they have forgotten that 10 years ago, when they were laboring to start this thing, I was there. Is this how they reward commitment? No. No. When growth is required, sentiment will not do. I must please bear that in mind. Never let your project, your relationship, your ministry, whatever it is, your vision, never let any of those things outgrow you. And the wisdom is not to keep it from growing. The wisdom is to keep growing. Because if you keep growing, then that thing will grow alongside. It's very, very critical. And lastly, as I wrap this up, please remember, and you can put it in the chat, God sees far beyond now. Far beyond now. This is so obvious that we forget it so many times. Okay? At the time Bathsheba was bathing, and David was drooling. No one knew. No one could have imagined that that was the mother of the next king of Israel. No one could have imagined that. At the time that she got pregnant for David and Uriah was going to get murdered, you probably would have said, this is a cursed woman. And then, of course, the child she gave birth to died. And you say, yes, it's because she's cursed. And her womb is cursed. But from that womb came the next king. And from that womb continued the generation, a lineage that ended up with the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the purest of human beings ever, from that seemingly dirty womb. God sees far beyond now. And you have made some mistakes. You've fallen into some error. And you really can't see beyond tomorrow. Oh, maybe next week or next month. As a father, as you can see, even with your binoculars, you really can't see beyond that. God sees way beyond that. He sees centuries beyond that. He sees millennia before, beyond that. And what am I trying to establish here? They say position determines perspective. Where you stand determines what you see. If you cannot see as far as God can, how dare you take God's rule by pronouncing judgment and saying to yourself, I'm finished. Saying to yourself, I can't amount to much based on what you see. But well, God sees far beyond that. Okay? She lost a son, Bathsheba. But she was going to give us to another son who was going to become the wisest man on us, the richest king ever. And Years down the line, centuries even, from my lineage would come one that would be the purest son of all, the son of the living God. From that woman, that woman that was sleeping with someone that wasn't her husband and then got her husband killed. Of course, not directly. But that's where God comes in. Sometimes it's okay when you have so much mud on your body because then his little print shows more. Jesus talked about it when he said, the bigger the sins have been forgiven, the more grateful you are. And that's the encouragement that wraps up this sermon today. God sees beyond now. He sees beyond the mistakes you made. He sees beyond the ones you're making tomorrow. He sees beyond the repercussion that is coming at you. He sees a glorious future ahead. And he sent us here today to remind you that although you are 40 years, 30 years, 60 years, your story is just beginning. And it's going to get a lot more interesting from here on. That's the word of the Lord. And some of the lessons that Bathsheba teaches us. I trust God that as you have learned these lessons and as you watch this service and as you choose to maybe watch it again, you will find yourself leading the kind of life God will have you lead. You'll find yourself making wise decisions. 
You find yourself trusting God more than ever before. Your esteem will be built up again. Your belief in God and your belief in yourself will be built up again. Your sins will become things of the past. The guilt that the devil puts on your heart every time you want to aspire to great things. That guilt will not be found anymore. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you today that God's word will come alive in your heart. God's wisdom will come alive in your heart in the name of Jesus. Your last foolish decision is the very last one you will take. From today, you begin to walk in God's wisdom in the name of Jesus that if you find yourself in, in, in a setting, in an environment that is less than pleasing. For some people, maybe someone listening to me right now, you feel like a Bathsheba in some case because she was in the palace, probably envied by people outside, but she was probably not having a great time in there. Some people are looking at you and saying, wow, wow, your life is so beautiful, but you know how painful it is right now. And I speak the peace of God to your heart. God is the balm in Gilead. I speak his healing concerning you in the name of Jesus. Your regret is taken away. I pray for that person who would smile by day, laugh by day, play by day, but cry at night. Your tears are wiped away. In the name of Jesus, I declare that your joy is full. In the name of Jesus, I declare that from now, you will know what to do. It's a promise the Lord made to us when he said, your ear shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it whether to turn to the left or to the right. From today, you will not lack direction. From today, I declare that in the biggest of mess, the Lord will make you a message in the name of Jesus. And I pray for that honest person listening right now whose relationship with God is nothing to write home about. Bathsheba that we share about did not have the gift of Jesus, did not have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have all of those now and it's a leverage for us. But if you have not been taking advantage of that leverage, I invite you to accept Jesus into your life right now. Accept him in your heart because there's no other place where you'd rather be. Again, we say Jesus is coming soon. It sounds cliche, but the big deal is he promised not to give us a warning. He promised not to tell us when. So why not live ready? If you want to give your life to Jesus, just put your heart on your chest. And say these words after me, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity. I confess my sins. And I ask you to forgive me. Accept me as your child from today. I declare I'm free from sin. I declare I'm yours forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters saying yes to you at this time. Lord, we ask that you accept them into the beloved. Keep them from sin. Keep them in you and make their lives beautiful from here on. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, if you said that prayer, I say big congratulations to you. It's the most uh, important and uh, positive decision you can ever make all right so i congratulate you for saying yes to jesus right now all right um if you would like to please reach out to us hello at peacechurchglobal.org or pastor at peacechurchglobal.org so that we can walk through this journey with you bible says as newborn babes desire the systemic of the world that you may grow thereby it's uh, it's it's a new world entirely and you may need someone to help you uh, on the path to grow so please send us an email i'll be glad to reach out to you all right great um at this time we want to give um i would like to say a big thank you to everyone that has been given um it's beautiful to see you partner with god's work uh, we have been able to touch lives we have been able to bless people and it's because of your generosity so we thank you for that as we want to give today the um Instructions for giving are right there on your screen. If you are giving within Canada, then we have Interact e transfer so you can just send your giving to give at peacechurchglobal.org. And if you're watching from outside Canada, you may want to use the Stripe option that we have there, or PayPal, all right? On either of these platforms, you just need to put in your card details. Um, the platform does the conversion, um, and whatever charges there are will come on us instead of you. Also, your bank uh, details are 
quite safe. All right. So thank you for giving. God bless you in Jesus name. Um, like I did announce last week, we are getting very, very close to starting our in-person service. Uh, please watch this space. We'll put information on our website and on our social media platforms um, as we get closer to that date. Okay, things are looking very good right here in Alberta. So uh, we are starting very, very soon. If you want to be a part of our rollout program, you want to serve in any way, please send us an email, hello at peacechurchglobal.org, or you can do us a DM on social media uh, so that we can have your details and see where best you can serve with us. Uh, like I did mention last week, uh, this doesn't affect our online streaming. And so if you're watching from outside Alberta, you have nothing to worry about. Okay, our uh, service experience will continue as per usual. All right, thank you very much for being a part of church today. At this point, I would like to hand you over to our amazing kids at Junior Church. I'm sure you saw them last week. Yes, it's their time for church. Bye for now. Thank you.